Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Evan Anderson um, from Stacklock, and hey, everyone. My name is Vyom Yadav. I work at Canonical in the security team, and yeah. And we're going to be talking today about a project um, that we both work on that's open source called Minder. Um, and give you a little background first. Um, so I'm currently at Stacklock. Previously, um, I've worked on serverless at um, VMware and Google. And before that, I was a Google SRE. Um, I was also one of the founders of the Knative project. And I don't know, run around causing trouble sometimes. And I recently graduated. And this is my first uh, gig at Canonical. I work in the security team at Canonical. And we do a bunch of things around maintaining uh, Ubuntu Pro, which is the Ubuntu archive, and a lot of security stuff as well. And apart from that, I basically work on our SSD LC goals. And that's why I like contributing to Miner, because it's a supply chain security platform. And I'm also involved in the Kubernetes community a bit. I primarily work with SIG release, if anyone knows about the Kubernetes release team. I am currently a release lead shadow in the team, and I'm also a CNCF ambassador. So that's a bit about me. And so this is all taking place in the context of an OpenSF project called Minder. Um, Minder's job is to help software development teams keep their platform, keep their software delivery platform secure um, by continuously enforcing policy, hopefully by making it easier rather than just bringing in a stick with like a big red dashboard and a whole list of, you know, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. Um, so. This is kind of a quick architecture diagram of what Minder looks like. So uh, people can go and apply policies. There's a command line. If you're, if you're using the Stacklock hosted instance, um, which is free for open source projects, um, there's a UI as well. Um, but you put those directions into the monolith. We store them, you know, authorization and authentication um, with OpenFGA and Keycloak. We love a whole bunch of CNCF technologies, and we'll be talking about some of them here. Um, and then as stuff happens in your OCI registries or your GitHub, we get notifications, and um, we use that to go in and fix and check if you're actually compliant with your policy. And then vom has been working on a component we call Reminder, which comes back and, uh, if we haven't heard from anything in a while, checks that it's still um, compliant with policy. And so... Our first architecture was really simple. It was just completely, you know, RPC comes in, webhook comes in, go run some stuff, update the database, update the state, get back to the user or get back to the webhook, uh, which is great when things are small. Yeah. And then things get a little bigger and people start to have multiple profiles and they're applying it to multiple entities yeah. and each profile has multiple rules. And pretty soon the set of evaluations that needs to happen when that webhook comes in, gets to be really big. And the webhook times out. And then GitHub says, oh, well, you didn't answer. And they send us another notification. And that was clearly not good. Um, so we needed to handle those webhooks faster. And um, this kind of gives you a sense of all the work that we're doing in the back end. But we needed to not do it when the webhook happened. We needed to do it later. And so VM's going to talk a little bit about um, yep. how so, we fix that. Yeah, thank you. So we use the synchronous pattern. And the synchronous pattern has some standardization in the ecosystem. You have open API, you have gRPC, you have GraphQL. But the synchronous ecosystem wasn't really cutting it for us. So we decided to go asynchronous. But there wasn't quite something in asynchronous that would, we could use similar to Synchronous back then. So we just devised something of our own. And synchronous messaging, if you don't know, it's quite, it's quite the simplest format of messaging. There's a client and there's an entity or a server. You just send a reply, you wait for that particular component to reply, and you are blocked until then, and when you get the response back, and then you complete whatever you wanted to complete. So the challenges with synchronous is that it's time bounded, first of all. Of course, you can add retries and stuff, but it's still time bounded. And it's a single destination. You can only send to a single server at a time. And with this you know, synchronous ecosystem, there is some standardization. So basically, you have your contract schema definition, your open API, definition, uh, open API spec, your profiles, your GraphQL schema. And this works on both sides, the client side as well as the server side. So on the server side, you generate the code and types and stuff. 
and then your server actually implements those functions or methods. And on the client side, you have the general library, which is for like almost any language. So you are not bounded to any particular language. Your server could be in one language and your client could be in the other, and you can generate SDKs based on like all the tooling that OpenAPI, gRPC, and GraphQL have. Asynchronous messaging, so asynchronous is basically okay, I want to do something, I just hand it off to the, whatever the entity or the server is, and I go back to whatever I do. And whenever I get back a response, I get a callback, and then I do like the stuff that I want to be associated with that callback. Now the challenge is, is that original sender can't easily get the results because you just dispatch an event, and after that you have no control over what happens with that event. And when you receive that, that event, that depends on the server and the error detection and handling. So you need retries, you need dead letter queues, so sometimes your messages, they mo might not be processed at all, and then you move them from poison queues to dead letter queues. So that's the kind of stuff you do with the asynchronous messaging system. I just, oh, go ahead to the next slide, but I wanted to, to pop in one more thing about uh, the asynchronous stuff. Um, FICO earlier was mentioning event sourcing, where you, know, you may send an event and weeks later it gets interpreted again, so you don't, like there isn't even a this is done for the asynchronous stuff. Whereas, you know, the synchronous stuff, it's really easy to get your head around when it's done. Mm -hmm. Asynchronous, it gets hard to even know what done means. Exactly. And with that, there's another problem that there is no standardization in the ecosystem. So you see that asynchronous ecosystem has standardization as strike through. And what basically happens in any of is any asynchronous system that on a higher level that you are implementing, you have some business logic and then you have a message broker. And that message broker basically has a library in the language that you're developing. And then you write some custom code for basically things like message format, translation, broker config, routing logic, etc. And this custom code is both on the producer and the consumer side. So it's basically usually a single code. So for producer, then you just put the message in for the format that expected by the protocol library, and it goes through the message broker, and then on the first it get implemented, so first that message is picked by the protocol library, then you kind of pop it out using your custom code, and then your business, business logic. So there is no standardization in this, because if you change your message broker, then you might have to rewrite most of that custom code. So there is no kind of standardization in the ecosystem. And asynchronous is kind of already complicated enough, so you shouldn't really be writing custom code rather than focusing on the business logic that you have. FICO was talking about how they had all their messaging tied up with their Java, the Java and Spring Boot, client, yeah, for yeah. example. And you'll see that we actually went down the same route. With um, Golang, yeah. With Go, yeah. And here comes Watermill. So how many of you have used Watermill in the past? Okay, so none of the hands are raised, cool. So Watermill, basically what Watermill is, is that Watermill basically is aiming to standardize eventing. Standardize eventing is a good thing, and you might think Watermill is really good, which it is, but it's standardizing eventing in Golang and just Golang, which means that if you have a producer in Golang and you want to have a subscriber to that, if those events, and you want to basically write that microservice in some other language, you cannot kind of use Watermill. You might have to create something of your own. And that is where we were talking about Minder. So Minder is a separate entity, and Reminder is a separate entity. So these both microservices are running, and right now both of them are written in Golang. And we had to write it in Golang because we were using Watermill, and Watermill is well, in Golang. Now, we made this choice when the project was four months old, and you know it helped us along a lot with solving some of the other problems. So do you want to sort of walk through what that workflow was? Yep after we adopted Watermill? Yep, so before I do that, I'll just give an overview of Watermill. So it's really easy to get started with Watermill. It's a great library. It comes with Go channel for testing. So it's all in your single application and you don't need to manage multiple components. It supports several transport layers with persistence. So it supports things like um, Go channels, then SQL, then NATS, then Kafka. It supports all of, all of that stuff and it's designed for at least one delivery, retries, and exactly when it's kind of hard and supports filter and fan out and a lot of other cool stuff. And with that, let's talk about the Minder workflow with events. So let's go step by step in this journey. So Minder is a supply chain security engine, and basically it informs, uh, so basically it ensures that your repository or whatever entity that you have registered is conformant to the policies you have registered for that entity. 
So when you apply a policy, it goes through the RPC, and then the affected entities are upgraded in the Postgres database that we have. So Minder evaluates which entities and pol so you specify in the policy which entities does this policy apply to. And after that, you evaluate those. So a policy has a rule, and a rule is on an entity. So the rules are evaluated on the entity, and the evaluation of so the evaluation is put up in a queue that this thing needs to be evaluated, and then it, the, the events are picked up from the queue and they are evaluated. So when they get in the queue, they are evaluated. So there's a rule evaluation section inside Minder. So Minder supports a lot of like Minder supports Rego to specify rules. It supports JQ and other cool stuff as well. So you could basically have your own custom rule, which would be evaluated using some of the Rego functions that we have. And that rule is evaluated, and the result is stored in the Postgres database. Now, Miner's rule evaluation runs asynchronously, and the results are stored back in the database, and like evaluation history table. So when we say evaluation, we mean, for example, go out and fetch some data from GitHub about what branch protection is there and make sure that it's valid. or Go fetch this Git, you know, clone this Git repository and check that, you know, the workflows that are there are, you know, matching some, you know, some policy that you've got. You know, don't use pull request target is a simple, one, simple security one that a lot of people um, struggle with. And so, there's some work to be done there in addition to just the evaluation where stuff needs to get fetched, and we want to limit how many fetches and how many clones and stuff are outstanding at a time. Yeah, and rule evaluation, like we discussed in the previous slides, it's quite resource intensive and time intensive, so it's easily to time out and those kind of things. And a pretty good example is like if you have registered Kubernetes as a repository, and cloning Kubernetes is over a gig, like it's over a gig repo, and it takes some time to do that. So Minder works in like an eventual or a level-based consistency system. And so when you get the queues, uh, when you get the evaluation rule in the queue, and then the evaluation rule happens on the entities that you have registered, it all gets sent to the rule evaluation engine, and then those results are stored in the Postgres database. And we use queues to limit the number of rule event, uh, entity evaluations in flight, so we can limit that so that our systems don't go down, basically. And those queues are persistent, so yeah. we don't lose track of the work we have to do in the future. Exactly. Um, if you're doing development and you're using GoChannel, uh, if you restart your server, yeah, all your events go away. But you're doing development. Nobody cares. Exactly. And so it's nice to be able to swap those out between production and development. Yeah, and Watermill, I think, helps up, helps up, helps and it, with it, that. Yeah. It helps a lot with that. Yep. And we build them both into the binary. So you just get one binary, and you can choose how dangerous you want to live. Yeah, you can specify that in the configuration. And Minder also does remediation. So basically, let's say you have some rule in Minder. And then your repository is not conforming to that. Let's say you have a dependabot configuration rule, and there is no dependabot in your rep uh, repository. Minder will actually open up a pull request, which is called a remediation. So Minder will open up a pull request stating the changes that should be there. And other type of remediation is with repository settings. So let's say you don't have secret scanning in enabled in your repository, and you have a rule for that. Minder would automatically make sure that whatever uh, your repository is, it is conformant to the rules that you have in your policies, and that can be secret scanning, um, branch protections, and all kind of stuff. And with that, we also receive events from GitHub webhooks. So let's say you made some changes to your repository. Minder needs to know about those changes to make sure your repository is still conformant. So we receive those GitHub webhook events, and then the whole cycle starts again with that event. So yeah, you can go play whack-a-mole and turn off secret scanning. Yeah. And Minder will turn it back on, and you can turn it off again and, you know, just play with it all day if you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, this, this happens through that same asynchronous flow because, again, maybe you changed a whole bunch of stuff and, you know, you ran Terraform and everything needs to be set back correctly after you run Terraform because, I don't know, your Terraform's bad. I've done it. <laughs> all right. So, not talking about the re reminder <clears throat> component. So, we receive events from the GitHub webhook, which is basically edge trigger. So when we receive events from the GitHub webhook, we internally like dispatch multiple other events so that the repository is conformant. But we want to go for an eventual level-based system where we achieve eventual consistency. So let's say you have something in your system and you changed a bunch of things. 
you, if we, even if those events get lost, you still want those things to be in a particular state. So Mind it does that with reminders. So it's basically periodic background reconciliation requests that are sent to the reminder, Minder server by Reminder. And then it sends those requests and those entities are reevaluated on the policies that you have so that the system is in a stable state and the state which is actually conformant with your policies. And Minder async has use cases. So we have a notification. So entity has changed. A rescan would be like kick all the rule evaluations. A rescan would be queued. Um, let's say if you update the rule itself or the profile itself, then also all those changes would be queued in and the associated entities would be reevaluated. And periodically visit what we discussed with Reminder. So the Reminder basically has intervals of scanning, so it has an algorithm behind which basically makes like if a repository was or entity was updated, let's say one hour ago, it, it's configurable, or do you want to update it again? So there's all this logic that makes like it easier for you to dispatch those event reminders in a manner that you don't overwhelm your system and in a stable manner that you can at least say with a guarantee that all entities in my system would be refreshed in a span of let's say 24 hours. So you can have those sort of guarantees with reminder. And it also accounts with deleting stuff. So let's say you deleted some rule or policy and the cascading delete like it's not urgent but that's a lot of, it has a lot of work that we need to do. Well, in particular for that last part, we're using Keycloak, and people can go in and delete their accounts from some other system, yep. and we need to catch up with that. But if you're the last admin on a project that has 200 repositories that need to get unregistered and cleaned up, mm -hmm. um, again, we just generate a lot of work. Let's push that off and put it in a queue where we can track and see what our backlog is. Um, so we've been using Watermill for about a year. And it's, it, we wouldn't have gotten where we are without it, but we've also, you know, found some places where it's a little rough. And so this next part of the talk is about our next steps to move forward past Watermill. Um, so the message ability has been, go been good. We haven't lost messages. It was easy to move from Go Channel to storing stuff in Postgres. Um, we chose Postgres because it meant that we didn't have to go and pick more backends, but the performance is middling and we've hit a couple of interesting um, scalability bugs. So we were like, uh, we were thinking, okay, well we need to move away from our Postgres queues and we need to start moving to something else. Um, when we're doing that, let's fix some of this other stuff. Um, so being Go specific uh, makes it hard to do, to, to pull in like Gen AI stuff that might be in Python. We have to put a little go bridge in there to call anything else. Um, Watermill messages don't have standard metadata. Having worked on cloud events before, which I'll talk about in a moment, it really, there's a lot of things that that standard meta metadata helps with. Um, and we found some interesting bugs because the dead letter queuing is implemented in the middleware and not in the messaging layer. Um, we found that the messaging layer actually sometimes does retries of the stuff that you're trying to dead letter queue, and then you get a lot of messages going through. So uh, there's a few layering violations that we'd like to clean up. So who here has used cloud events before, has looked at them? More hands go up every year, um, but it looks like a lot of folks are still not familiar with it. So um, cloud events aims to help bring some of that standardization that we got with HTTP um, which is the basis for like gRPC and the basis for GraphQL and the basis for open API to this asynchronous flow. And so it helps, it gives you some standard headers like HTTP headers to answer questions when you look at one of these event records. You know, you pick it up off the floor and you're like, oh, this is a, you know, minder entity refresh event. Um, it happened 17 minutes ago to this particular entity, um, you know, and here's other information like that. One of the great things when monitoring queues that I like to do is ask the question, you're currently processing a message. How long ago was that message sent? How far back in time is that processing? If it's less than a minute, awesome. Or, you know, if it's less than a second, depending on your, your latency requirements, you can track that over time and you can say, hey, we're doing well or we're doing badly, um, regardless of what your message throughput is. 
If you track your backlog of messages and all of a sudden you get real busy, but you're clearing those messages real fast, you'll still get alerts going off and your you know, developers will get paged. And since that's me, I don't want to get paged. I want it, you know, if we're still processing things quick. So I love having that, you know, oh, I sent it a minute ago, you know, that's what our latency is on this queue. Um, and it also supports stuff like um, open telemetry tracing. And it maps this down onto a bunch of different transports. So whether I'm using Kafka or whether I'm using RabbitMQ or no. MQTT or NATS, um, I can take a message from one and I can spill it onto another. And I know how to do that transformation mechanically. Um, now that means that cloud events doesn't do the, quite the same thing that Watermill did. Watermill was one big bundle for everything and it kind of hid underneath like your NATs or your pubs, your, um, you know, Google PubSub or whatever um, behind a Watermill abstraction. And cloud events says, here's a message, create your transport and feed it into the client. And then you can, you know, send the messages using that client and cloud events will take care of those metrics and the correlation IDs and the transport will take care of stuff like delivery and dead lettering and things like that. And so you can configure one part with your native NATS tooling or your native Kafka tooling and all the dashboards and stuff that those have understand the lower level stuff. And then the higher level stuff is in the cloud events library, which has a lot of different language implementations. So this is kind of the old and the new code, if you're curious. Um, where it says NATS new publisher over here, that's inside the NATS module. This is all watermill configuration and watermill NATS options. And if you have some NATS configuration that doesn't match up, um, it just doesn't fit. Um, over on, I don't know why that says CE NATS, that's just NATS. Um, so I copied this, events, yeah. oh, I, I copied this from our code yeah. and our code was cloud events. So, um, but this is just opening a new NATS connection with the Jetstream options and so forth that NATS has. Um, and so if you know NATS anywhere, you can just map it in. If you know Kafka anywhere, you can just map it into cloud events. Um, and then you feed that consumer into the cloud events client and it will wrap on all the tracing and message IDs and timestamping and the rest of it. And uh, Watermill does not do that, the timestamping problem that Evan mentioned. So Watermill does not do that out of the box. And we actually had something custom that we added timestamps to every message. And the good thing with cloud events is that the standard uh, fields that you get, some of them are mandatory, some of them are optional. That's the standardization across all message brokers you have. And, and the clients will fill that in, in many of the useful cases. Right. So you can leave it empty and it'll do the right thing and you don't have to hunt around every single publisher. Um, so this next part's kind of the fun, interesting bit that we are still in the middle of taking this step from one to the next because um, we don't want to lose any messages. So we've implemented a publisher that uses a flag to decide, do we publish stuff to the existing um, Watermill SQL queue, or do we publish yeah. it to Cloud Events and Nats? And we listen on both topics so that we can pick everything up and then we can use the flag to move things over piece by piece or roll things back if we discover, you know, hey, we got 70% of the way there and now we've hit a performance problem. Well, let's go back because at least we know those devils, you know, back in that side and, you know, do some more testing and figure out what to do. So I strongly recommend keep that little intermediate layer there, FICO was talking as well about having an abstraction layer, so that you can do this kind of messaging switch over um, without needing to Move on shim thing. a new layer in and then, you know, do the rest of it. Um, so uh, this is basically it for us. Um, cloud events, if you're, if you're looking at doing new asynchronous messaging, I'd strongly recommend looking at it at least. Yeah. It's really simple, it's like HTTP. And so um, you get headers and they have some types, unlike HTTP, and then you get a payload. Um, and consider doing this as an external API. Um, an opportunity that I may still go back and do, but I missed the first time around is we expose a history of when we've gone and fixed things and so forth. Those should all have been cloud events mm -hmm. so that you could just pull them down and stream them and then go stick them in Kafka or whatever if you want to you know, process them further yourself. And right now they're a custom envelope. And so um, 
maybe we'll fix that and we'll do a V2 of that API. Mm. I always hate doing V2s of APIs because it throws away all the investment to the V1 um, that, that your customers have done. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, there's also a few CNCF projects um, I think we'll be presenting next. Uh, Knative and Dapper mm -hmm. both um, speak cloud events pretty natively. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're new and and not looking to build this build all this yourself, take a look at those. Um, thank you. Thank you.